Chapter 3, Part 2 It's the spring of 1949, and I'm 13 and a half. With my best friend Maria, I am sitting in the very front seat of the top deck of a double-decker bus as it makes its way down Lower Fifth Avenue toward Greenwich Village, which I've been assured is the very last stop, thus impossible to miss. Suddenly, we see it. The famous arch that's supposed to be the entrance to Washington Square and to lots to other things. And to lots of other things. Perhaps a life of romance and, and adventure that I've heard about from four older, very knowledgeable, trustite, trust, excuse me, trotskite, trotskite girls. Excuse me. Who I've met in the basement of Hunter College High School. Juniors who disdain the Borgios, Borgois cafeteria upstairs. They lunch secretly on yogurt deep in the locker room. They carry bags of knitting under which there are copies of the Michelin, militant, excuse me which they hawk around 14th Street nearby every day after school. They have trots, Trotskyte boyfriends, whom they made sweaters and argyle socks for and endlessly discuss. They never quite explain to me what Trotskyte is, but it seems as if you are one. You're headed for a trouble. You're headed for trouble, not only in the fascist with the fascists but with des detestable teen age stalinists who've been known to harass sellers for the militant and even beat them up i admire the darling of these girls tremendously i admire the daring of these girls tremendously their whole style in fact dark clothes and long earrings the cigarettes they smoke illicitly the many cups of coffee they say they require to keep them going. Friendly as they are, however, they, they never invite me on their rounds. With Olympian disinterest, they deline delineate a territory that it's up to me to explore for myself. As the bus lurches under the arch, Maria and I are leaning all the way forward in our seats, clutching hands. It's at that moment when fantasy and expectation collide with reality, when what you've been told exists really turns out to be there. Not quite as you've pictured it. Not quite as you've pictured it, but close enough. There is the arch, as described by the Trotskite girls, and there is the foundation, the circle and the square where, according to them, people gather every Sunday to sing folk songs. I'd imagine, I'd imagined hordes of people, a whole guitar, and banjo strumming population, and their music ringing through the park. But hadn't trusted the glamour of that picture in my mind. I thought we mightn't find anyone at all. Actually, today there are about six of them. A few young men in old army jackets, a tall, blonde girl in faded jeans, a man in a wheelchair. They look a little drab, in fact, perhaps because it's also begun to dr begun to rain. The drops fall on Maria and me as we rush over to them from the bus. Washington Square is empty out is emptying out fast. Wouldn't you know it? We've arrived just too late. In another moment, they'll be packing up their instruments. They stand their ground. They stand their ground, however. Their men turn up the collars of their jackets. As their audience vanishes, they launch into a new and appropriate song, quote, Let the Circle Be Unbroken, which they sing as loudly as possible into the wind that thins out their voices, disperses them like so like so much smoke, the, the rain rattles down harder. I wouldn't move out of it for anything. I've fallen in love with them all. 
It's as though a longing I've carried inside myself has suddenly crystallized. To be lonely within a camaraderie of loneliness. I watch them intently, especially the blonde girl, as if I could wish myself into her. She can't be that much older than I am, maybe 16, and yet she's been accepted by these grown-up looking men. At that time in my life, I have the strange conviction that the last person any adult male would be interested in is a young girl. She has glasses and long, pale, stringy hair and a skinny body hidden inside a man's shirt several sizes too big for her that's torn at one shoulder. My mother would never let me out in anything that was torn. You'd think she was beautiful, the way she acts. And maybe she is. The more I watch her, the more I come to believe it. She's shivering and laughing in the rain, twisting her hair into rope like wash she's wringing out. One of the men holds open his jacket, and she ducks into her, into the shelter of it, standing pressed against his side in a warmth I can only imagine with despair. Even now, I only look eleven. That's my curse. My outside doesn't reflect my inside, so no one knows who I really am. With my friend Maria, it's a different story. Maria's outside has that eerie agelessness some girls get so quickly and mysteriously, blooming overnight into child woman. Maria's baby fat has given way to definition. Cheekbones, sharp little breasts, the slant of her eyes hint at experience she hasn't lived yet. It's Maria who connects us to this group of strangers. The rain is getting serious. The sky is definitely black. Calling it a day, the young men snap their guitars into cases. Maria just walks up to one of them. Quote, where are you going now? She says to him. Quote, are you going to sing somewhere else? If it were left to me, I couldn't have gotten out one word. He looks at her and smiles at, at this dark, either ra eager, rather exotic. Willowy, willowy kid. Quote, did anyone ever tell you? More and more people keep telling Maria. Quote, you just, you look just like Jean Tier Tierney. Quote, that's because my face is so Russian, she explains modestly. Quote, both my parents are Russian, you know. Quote, are you going, to, are you going to come back next Sunday? She asks. Quote, my friend and I are learning the guitar. Is that so? He says. Quote, maybe next time you'll bring yours. But we don't want to play very well yet. But we don't play very well yet. This young man still smiling at Maria in the most extraordinary friendly way. Extraordinarily friendly way. Quote, why don't you come along and have some coffee? We're all going to the art center. Your friend too. He says, that's how easy it was. I got home at the first Sunday just in time for dinner. What did I tell my parents that night? Marie and I spent the afternoon doing homework. We went to the movies. Did my mind race guiltily through the current attractions, picking the one we saw? I knew the truth would be fatal. We took the Fifth Avenue bus to Washington Square. We talked to strange men. We went with them to the art center, which was not a center of the all the arts, but I'd first thought, as I'd first thought, but was a lunch, luncheonette on 8th Street. A classic greasy spoon that would be rechristened, re excuse me, that would be rechristened the griddle less misleadingly two years later. Rechristened. I'm having a hard time with words today, excuse me. There we had coffee, which I was not allowed to drink at home. It seemed as wicked to drink coffee as to drink a martini. We had to put six sugars in mine and to get it down. The men talked to Maria, really, rather than to me. 
Mostly, they talked to each other about versions of old of folk songs that they wrote down in little notebooks. And someone called Pete Sigger, and there, and there was a joke ending with the punchline, quote, What's the party line on that? Which made them all laugh. The blonde girl necked with her boyfriend. She kicked off her shoes under the table. The man in the wheelchair was a doomed millionaire who who lived on Park Avenue. He was a hemophiliac, which had never, which I had never heard of. Maria whispered to me it meant that if he got even a tiny scratch, he'd bleed to death. He was bloated and greenish pale with brown circles under his eyes and quite irritable which seemed understandable under the circumstances. He collected guitars, banjos, hundreds of folk and blues records, people, too, these people, for whom we've heard he gave parties uptown, astonishing the snooty doorman with his guests. Would Maria and I ever go to any of these parties? What all this seemed to promise was something I'd never tasted in my life as a child. Something I told myself was the real life. Was real life. This was not the life my parents lived, but one that was dramatic, unpredictable, possibly dangerous. Therefore, real, infinitely more worth having. In trying to trace the derivations of this notion of experience i come to blind alleys it was simply there all of a sudden full-fledged like a fever i'd come down with the air carries ideas like germs infecting some not others real life was not to be found in the streets around my house or anywhere on the upper west side for that matter or in my school of girls grubbing joyously for marks, hysterical about geometry exams and Latin homework, flirting ridiculously with these seventy with the seventy year old elevator operator, the only male visible on the premises. Real life was sexual, or rather, it often seemed to take the form of sex. This was the area of ultimate adventure where you would dare or not dare. It was much less a question of desire. Sex was like a forbidden castle whose name could not even be spoken around the house, so feared it was so feared was its power. Only with the utmost vigilance could you avoid being sucked into its magnetic field. The alternative was to break into the castle and take its power for yourself. We go down to the square next Sunday. The next Sunday, and the one after that, and the following one. The weather gets warmer. The fountain in the circle is finally turned on. People come out of the cold water flats in and into the sun. New, new musicians arrive and either become regulars or make memorable one-shot appearances, like the man who came all the way down from Harlem with his wash tub and broomstick one string bass or the old white mustached italian mandolinist who tremoloed his way one afternoon through quote oh mary don't you weep don't you mourn and quote take this hammer and quote put it on the ground spread it all around if you dig it with a hoe it will make your flowers grow Proletarian musicians cause the particular excitement. Although we sing the music of, quote, the people, it is they, after all, who are the genuine article. My whole being during the humdrum week is focused on these Sundays. At night, I shut myself into my room and strum the guitar incessantly, singing the songs I've learned under my breath so as to escape my mother's critical ear. Quote, why are you spending so much time on that? You should be playing the piano more if you want to get away, if you want to get anywhere. But the guitar, not the piano, is my passport to the world downtown. Besides the music, 
I'm learning a great many other things very rapidly, such as the fact that America is a place of enormous injustice and inequality, where the little children of minors starve in shacks and where Negro men are lynched or jailed for crimes that are not even crimes, such as whistling at a white woman. In the South, there is one such prisoner facing execution named Willie McGee, and I put little stickers saying, quote, save Willie McGee on the walls of every subway stop on the way to school. I learned that a picket line is something you never cross, lest you become a fink, and that espresso is black and bitter, so much it's better to order a cappuccino made with steamed frothy milk and cinnamon. And that soul kissing, which I only hear about and do not experience, is letting a man put his tongue in your mouth in direct violation of all sanitary taboos, such as not letting another person even use your toothbrush. And that going crazy is not something frowned upon in the village, but sort of respected if done by artists. I long to turn myself into a bohemian, but lack the proper clothes. Oh, the belts I see in the Sorcerer's Apprentice, which is tucked away in a little courtyard of 8th Street, like a cobbler's shop in a fairy tale. That's where everyone gets them. There are two styles that are popular. One laces up in the front like the girdle of Lena the Goose Girl. The other fastens dramatically with a spiral made of brass about the size of a saucer. Such a belt. Aside from enhancing your appearance, which I was sure it would immeasurably, is a badge, a sign of membership in the ranks of the unconventional. The way, the way is smoothed for the weather of this belt, for the wearer of this belt, excuse me, or of the dirndl skirt of lumpy hand woven material that usually goes with not to mention the sandals of crisscrossing up the ankle, or the finishing touch of a piece of freeform jewelry like a Rorschach test figure dangling down to the midriff of by a thong. The way is smooth because the problem of outside matching inside is so beautifully resolved by this simple means, which only costs money. I ha I'd have been humiliated if anyone had told me that the desire to possess these items was, with a different context, like to desire to, po like the desire to possess a certain kind of baseball jacket. Somehow, early on, I do manage to acquire a pair of thong copper earrings. Oh, oh, excuse me, not thong, of long copper earrings. They clink reassuringly against my neck in the slightest breeze, and I pull at my earlobe and pull at my earlobes. I carry them with me at all times in case I need them. They constitute my downtown disguise. Peering into the dirty mirror of a gum of a gum machine in the West Fourth Street station of the IND to see how different they make me look. I put them on before I walk over to the square. I'm cool and clever as any double agent needs to be. No one on 116th Street would guess my destination. I have switched my route to the subway, so much faster than the bus. I can get to the village a whole half hour earlier and wait till the very last minute to go home to make my 7 o'clock curfew. Sunday by Sunday, my, la my quote, last minute gets later pushing the outer boundaries of safety. At 7.15, I can still walk in the door with some innocuous excuse for my mother. At 7.30, arrival will bring a storm of frantic where were you's upon me. I shoot for the area in between. Nothing seems crueler than my curfew. I, s I feel I'm missing everything, whatever everything it is that happens after 7 o'clock. Maria's always going to do different pla Maria's always going to different places with people for cappuccino because her mother, a divorced ex actress, doesn't seem to care where she come when she comes home. 
By 6.15, I started getting ready to tear myself away from for another week. As the seconds bleed from the minutes, I'm in an odd state of heightened longing and anxiety. I feel much the same in later years whenever I part from a man I love. The anxiety is not so much over leaving as over an impending fading of identity.